Welcome to part seven of auditing standard number five. This is understanding likely sources of misstatement. Because AS5 has over a hundred pages, which is really heavy reading, I've made it easier by breaking it down into smaller parts and giving you the Cliff Notes version. This training gives context to SOX 404 requirements. It's meant to be an easy to understand breakdown of dense words and because the literature there's so many parts to the literature I have broken it down to smaller parts part one part two and you can see here based on your focus or the areas you're interested in you can then listen to selected parts and it's meant for people who need a refresher or if it's your first time exposure to SOX 404 you can then get an overview this table of contents came directly out of Auditing Standard 5 from the PCAOB. I've just made it into chunks so that it's easier to understand and follow. This section is on understanding likely sources of misstatement. So if you remember going back in the beginning when I gave you some context about how the SOX audit came about, it's because historically, the auditors used to audit the financial statements, basically the end result of what your financial statements and your disclosures should be. And through the Enron scandal, WorldCom, Ty, uh, Tyco, and some of these others, there we realized that the source of the misstatements, we need to get to the root cause of the potential sources. And that's how we got the two integrated audits, not only audit of the numbers themselves, but the process to get to the numbers. And here, what paragraph 34 is saying is you have to understand the sources of the misstatements. And to understand the sources of misstatements, you have to understand the flow of transactions. And that starts from the transaction gets initiated to when it's authorized, when it's processed in the system of some sort, and when it finally reaches the general ledger or the actual financial statements themselves. Those are the areas where you're focused on. And in order to do this, as the SOX auditor, we have to identify the points within the processes where a misstatement could happen, especially, especially or including fraud. Where could a misstatement happen? And it further goes into the objective of identifying. So once you find the potential of where the misstatements could happen, you also have to find the controls that address these potential misstatements and identify controls that management has implemented over the prevention or detection of the use or disposition of company assets, unauthorized acquisition, use, or disposition of assets. So again, this goes back to the root of, you know, in the beginning when we had people potentially um, stealing certain assets or uh, writing up certain assets or uh, selling off certain parts of assets. This is where that bullet comes in. And because the degree that's required, it bas 30, paragraph 35 basically says that the external auditors can, based on their judgment, can do this type of work on their own or they can get the assistance of others and, prov and provide that. So we're now going to essentially say uh, uh, 36 talks about understanding how IT affects the company's flow of transactions. And this paragraph is really important because more and more over the 13 years that we have been doing SOX, the emphasis continues to grow on IT because IT is so prevalent. You can't even breathe nowadays without IT. And maybe in the old days, you could just do QuickBooks and so forth. But for public companies now, there are so many um, tools, applications. And it's saying you also have to understand how IT impacts the flow of transactions. And it even references for you the uh, paragraph 29 and Appendix B on how do we identify and assess material misstatement related to information technology. So if you wanted to read more, specifically on this, you could even get to um, auditing standard number 12 to, to get more details. 
Now, this note here is really important because IT is not a separate evaluation. It's an integral part of the top-down approach. And this is why, as an organization, we have put so much focus on not just separating, oh, it's the SOX auditor the, on the financial side versus the IT side. This is why we focus on integrating it so that I want people who understand manual controls on the finance side also understand IT. Maybe you are not the in-depth expert, the subject matter expert on the IT systems, but you have to understand it because it's commingled now. That's our advantage is that we are auditors, we're accountants who understand systems and processes. That's what makes us unique, and that's why it's important for us to learn more about systems and how they impact the financial statements. And now you get to 37 talks about walkthroughs. Right. So in order to, we can actually, the client can describe to us or the company can describe to us how a process works. But really, the best way to validate that we really understand the process is by doing a walkthrough. And here's what, in doing the walkthrough, you have to get it from origination, from the beginning of the process, including the information, uh, the IT system, until it gets into the end of your records using the same documents and information system that the company uses. So when we're doing the walkthrough, that's why we often say, sit by the desk of the person doing the work and ask them, show me when you first get that PO, what do you do with it? What does that sheet of paper look like? Maybe it's an email, maybe it's a notification, maybe it's all in the system, you go to a dashboard, but that literally we are putting ourselves in their shoes and walking through significant transactions from beginning to end. And the types of things that we can do for a walkthrough is going to be the inquiry. So the type of procedures you can inquire, you can ask someone, you can observe them, you can look at the actual documents themselves, inspect it, like look at the report, flip through the pages and see what they're circling, what they're looking at, and re-performing the control, but it's so important not just to do inquire it or just the interview alone. It's a combination that makes the walkthrough more effective. And really, you can actually see through the process owner's eyes, the control owner's eyes, on what it is that they're doing and why they're doing these steps. When you're doing the walkthrough, you want to question, ask the person, ask the control owner or the process owner about their understanding of what's required in terms of what, what who has to sign off on this. What happens if you look at this and it's not signed off? How does it get kicked back up into the system to be reviewed or approved? Once it's approved, how does it float through? What documents are required? What support is required? These types of questions are necessary, not just that the the client or the, the person you're sitting down just says, here's what I do, and then you write down. You want to ask them, well, why do you do that? What could go wrong when you do this? What are the typical scenarios? What types of mistakes do you catch by doing this? And for us, the value add to our clients oftentimes is that fresh set of eyes. Well, why do you do something that takes 10 steps? Maybe it can be done in eight steps. Or the reverse is sometimes they're going through all the procedures, but maybe there's not a control, and we can help them say, you know, if you in inserted this particular thing, this would make the process either go by faster or would be more accurate and help you in the future. So that's why walkthroughs and understanding likely sources of misstatements are required. It's in here, but the walkthrough is the process of doing it, and that's it for the walkthroughs.